后备箱，然后他会把这一箱丢在他巴士，然后他另外一个车的巴士，然后再后备还给他。所以刚刚那一整条路就是之前都知道，就遇到这些奇怪的情况。嗯，所以你有在用？
这三个英文讲的。差不多 ，OK， 好，那就是很高兴我们回来，就是我们今天勾认社群鬼的，应该是最后一个 talk， 对，然后是有，我觉得这题目非常的酷，就是一般就是勾认可能就会拿来开发 web service 最大众嘛，那今天这题目就是用勾来开发一个网页中文系统，就是我当刚看到题目就觉得啊，这真的是太屌了，就一定要让 Toby 来来讲一下这个题目，好，然后所以。不过等一下 ，Toby 带的这个 session 会用会用英文进行的，对，然后所以就是呀， yeah, 就是先跟大家讲一下。好，那我们就掌声欢迎 Toby。好 ，testing 好，呃，对，那个这今天这个 session 呢会用英文讲的，所以如果有什么问题的时候，可以在后面 Q&A 问，那 Q&A 英英文、中文都可以。这样好 ，So um。Today I'm going to introduce my talk today, which is called RSOS, Building a Web Desktop System from the Ground Up with Go. So um, if I have to summarize today's talk in one sentence, it would be something like, I accidentally created a web desktop system, and it turns out to be really great. So um, before I start this sharing session, I want to ask a simple question. Has anyone used a web desktop system before? You can raise up your hand if you have ever used one. All right, one. Anymore? Like, you have heard of what is a web desktop system? Anyone? Okay, no? <laughs> All right. Okay, um, for those who never heard of or don't know what is a web desktop system, a web desktop or web top is a desktop environment embedded in a web browser or similar kind of applications. So in simple words, you are using your desktop environment inside your browser, like Firefox, Safari, for example. And um, before, RSOS actually released as an open source project. There are already a few of this kind of open source desktop projects um, on the uh, market on the internet. One of the more famous one is the OS.js, which is a JavaScript-based um, web desktop environment. And there are also different kind of um, native desktop clone websites. For example, this is an example of the Windows 98.js, which is a CSS and HTML5 clone of the Windows 98, of course. But um, for RSOS, it's most likely categorized in the web desktop-like management interface. So this is an example of the NAS management interface from Synology DSM. And um, I will talk about how it's similar with the RSOS related sections. So what is RSOS? RSOS stands for RS Online System, which is an open source web desktop system developed by me and a few authors since late 2016. This project originally written in PHP, and due to some technical reasons, we migrate to Golang later. And the project is currently under uh, open source under GPL v3. So um, in this three second videos, I will show you um, what our user actually use RSOS for. So um, So of course, uh, RSOS is a web desktop environment, so you can do basically any kind of file operations on it. Some people do use it as a self-hoist cloud storage system for storing the files, or as a Google Drive alternatives. And, um, but it is mostly used as a music and video streaming system. So basically you stream, stream video from your own server or your own systems. Okay. Um, all right. Um, before I go into the technical details, I want to introduce our offers and our users. So um, I'm Toby Choi. I'm currently a master student in NCKU. I previously graduated from the Hong Kong Polytechnic Universities, and I'm the main offer and the project owner of this project. So basically, anything that is not written by our co-offers are written by me. And on the right hand side, this is Alan Yang. He is a US student uh, studying CE. I remember. Um, he handles anything related to um, security features of the system, including OAuth, um, LDAP, um, IP blacklist, etc. He is also our QA engineer that always breaks our nightly builds, so we call him the software destroyer. Um, this project is used by a few of the te ad tech companies and VFX Studio and other organizations I'm going to list here. 
So our software system doesn't actually start as a web desktop system. It actually starts as a music player. So back in 2015 and 2016, when I'm still a high school student, I developed myself a music archiving and storage system. So basically, um, it referenced something, another program called Sacra Script Player, and I added a music player to it so it can play music. And later on, I brought my search server, so I migrated from, I remember, svb.net to PHP and make it um, the RS online system where it can now stream video and music to my phone via the internet. And a few years later, I entered universities. I add in more and more features into it, including authentications, um, more different kind of web apps to handle different kind of files types. I even add a file manager into it so that you can basically manage files across different web apps. However, I encountered into a problem where a dashboard-based system actually have in common, which is when you're trying to do multitasking, like doing a file operation, for example, it is much slower compared to a Windows-based system. One example is that you want to move one folder, uh, one, one file from one subfolder to another subfolder. On Google Drive, you do right-click, select, and then move it multiple steps upward, and then select the file you want to put in it, and then move there. And on a Windows-based system, you just drag and drop across two windows. Simple, right? So that is why I made my first prototype of a web desktop environment. And it basically do two things. One is, remember uh, the file you put into it in the location of the, on your desktop. And secondly, is open um, other kind of web app in an iframe. And this system, um, I open source this system, and then many, many users came into using the system. And we improved it throughout a few years of time. And this is the version now. We have much better localization, much better design, and overall, much better user experience. So. In case you wonder how we actually use this system on mobile phone, we actually have a specialized interface storage called the RSOS Mobile, which is powered by PWA. So you can also do uh, multitasking on your phone with these PWA applications. And of course, RSOS still got its original media player function um, in the latest build. And in this photo in here, you can see that this is our music player. And otherwise, this is our video player in the latest versions. So um, the content of today's sharing. First of all, I will talk about how our service work. I will talk about why and how we migrate from PHP to Golang. Um, what we actually think of when we are choosing a new architecture for developing this system, how we actually enable user scripting in Golang, using a JavaScript interpreters, how we design hot pluggable modules for Go. And if we got enough time, I will talk about OTA updates in Golang. All right, no problem. OK, let's start. How it works. Um, many people s see this project and think it might be some kind of uh, web VNC or some kind of remote desktop thing. But actually, no. Um, the RSOS is more like uh, a virtualized OS on top of a real operating system. So on the bottom here, uh, we have the um, Debian or Windows. Mostly, we recommend our users to use this. And this operating system provides packages or APIs for us to work on, for example, like core utils, IP root for networking stuff on Linux, and winfrey.dll and WMIC on Windows. So in the RSOS core, we developed the real file system and the hardware adapters for this kind of uh, packages in the, the host operating system. And we use these adapters to provide something called a virtual file system and a virtual hardware abstraction layers that further can be used by our gateway interface, something similar to serverless um, scripting, I will talk about in later sections, and a RESTful API that can be used by web apps and subservers, and finally integrated into a web desktop interface. So this is the overall in infrastructure of the uh, RSOS system. So uh, because there's a time limitation, I'm going to go into detail about how these things work. But in simple words, the virtual file system was originally developed to protect the host OS to, from something like path escape or some script injections. But it also has a side effect of bringing an easy web app development. So um, we currently separate the VPath translator into three paths. So we have a real file system abstraction object, or the real object, where um, a path is translated direct to a file on a physical disk on the host operating system. We have a virtual object that handles things that don't translate to a real file system, but some kind of uh, tree data structure or representation of a file 
in the host operating system. And finally, a backup uh, abstraction object, which handle something similar to RAID and snapshot, but not exactly splitting the files in the disk. So um, this is how we actually access it in the, uh, in the web app programming. So we have a virtual path you see here. Uh, which doesn't actually exist in the host operating system, but we translate it to another path that exists on the host operating system to do further processing. So another feature of the RSY system is called the hardware abstraction layers. So we have a set of APIs that provide the same data structure across different kind of OS for making hardware specific conditions to be optimizable by our code. So for example, we have something called low memory upload mode for specific design for running on Raspberry Pi 0W with 500 me uh, megabyte of RAM. And this is achievable by something called conditional compilations. So basically, we have different kind of adapters for different kind of operating system on our operating system. So uh, if you wonder how we actually do it, we do it like this with some shell magic. And uh, for Windows, it's a mess. So <laughs> I'm going to skip this part. So how we actually migrate from PHP to Go and why we actually need to do that? Uh, PHP is a good language, right? It's suitable for rapid development. It is easy to code. Uh, you don't need compilations. And at the time I'm actually developing this project, many other NAS OS like OpenMediaVault or Nextcloud do use PHP for their front end. However, when we're actually trying to use this for moving some large file, for example, when we try to create a virtual machine manager on top of it, and we start to get some problems, uh, when PHP actually do this kind of heavy lifting things, it will stuck the Apache because of the fast CGI design. And we can actually have a way to let the user know if the server is crashed or it's just freezed. It. And a few of the users at the time also complained to us about this issue. And we need to serve out an update zip file for them to actually patch the system. So we can't use anything with dependencies like Node.js or Python. We also can't change the runtime environment, of course. So what we can do is something pre-compiled, run very fast, and easy to use. We thought about C and C++, but later on we choose Go because it has a really cute mascot, um, as well as they have something called PHP to Go module. Basically, um, our developers originally are PHP developers, right? They don't really know how to write Golang. So um, we've discovered this module and it allowed them for easy translation of their PHP script into Golang. So this is how I lead my team to start migrating from PHP to Go. And basically, at that time, everyone of us only know PHP. And now we started transition to Golang at the time. And this is how we fix it temporarily. So um, instead of PHP directly moving the files, we have a PHP going to the kernel, the <coughs> Linux kernel or the user space. And then it will start a Go program, where the Go program would do the heavy lifting thing, like file operations, for example and using a Go routine to write the, the file progress into a log file where the client can read. So our client can know that the server is not freezed it and the server is responding to new requests. So, um, but why we eventually migrate the whole system to Go, you ask? Well, because um, once we release this update, um, what we call the FSEXEC for handling file operations, and more and more users ask for faster operation on different kind of perspective of the system. Like FS Convert for handling UTF-8 conversion. Uh, back then, PHP 5 and PHP 7 doesn't actually handle uh, Unicode that well. Um, they also request FS zip for handling large file zipping. Like when you download from Google, they will automatically zip files, right? And it, to a point that the PHP project contained too many Go programs. So we decided, to s OK, screw it. We just uh, remove the PHP part and then rewrite the whole system in Golang. So this is why we actually migrate to a new language. And with new language, we can pick a new architecture to work with. So what is the correct architecture to work with? Well, um, at the time, we think that SOA is the best option because um, according to our usage, we think that SOA might be the future. And we also consider about microservices, but back then, we are just university students. We don't know how to mi write microservices. And eventually, it will turn out turn become a distributed monolith, which is even more difficult to maintain. So we designed it based on some extreme use case we received uh, in our previous development. So in our previous development, when we are working on the RS Online beta system, we do receive a few emails asking for a really specific use case. One of the most uh, memorizable one is that 
a teacher from I don't know where, maybe Africa, maybe, that he wants to set up a NAS system for their student in a remote part of the village that doesn't have internet. And he sent us an email for asking how do we set up the RS Online Beta in an environment with completely no internet. And we, based on his request, we actually spent a few months to add complete offline support into our beta version, including removing any CDN and et cetera. So in the new architecture, we decided to stick with these two special requirements. First of all, the system has to run with no network environment. And secondly, it can be run as a portable app. So basically, you have put your complete desktop environment in a USB drive and then put it everywhere. So single executable is the best option here. And we also add a few rules for developing the new system, including no external runtime dependencies, like if your module requires FFmpeg to run and the system doesn't have FFmpeg, the system cannot cause the core to crash. And no runtime on dependencies, including no CDN and no external APIs. And we also classify it into um, three categories, core, web apps, and subservices, where the web apps are application that requires mostly front-end calculation, HTML5 web app, for example, with little to no back-end access. And subservices are for those that cannot be fit into the first two categories, we're going to subservices. And this is the project structure, which is a really standard Golang project structure. Um, we do use mod instead of PKG because, well, we like it. And um, with a bunch of GoCo of the highest abstraction layers of the whole project. Um, if you want to take a look at the source code, you can scan the QR code right here. But um, later on in the Q&A section, I will give you guys this kind of these cute cards, where um, you can have your QR code on the cards as well. So um, web app and back end. how we actually migrate the PHP script um, into our new system. So um, I think most of you have written PHP sometime before, right? So um, in simple words, PHP is an event-based language. So it doesn't actually run in a loop like Python, Node.js, or Godot. They only execute when you request it. So we need to replace the PHP part and make it Golang part. So we also have two requirements for this. One is hot pluggable. Uh, we don't want to recompile our system every time we install new web apps. And we also want it to be migrated with as little rewrite as possible. So replacing a single or limited number of PHP APIs is really simple. You just replace the .php with nothing, and then you rewrite your PHP script in a Golang um, HTTP handle functions. However, we have like a hundred and few PHP scripts that need to be migrated, and there's no way for us to add an API for each of the PHP scripts to be replaced. There will be too many API endpoints, and we can't actually hand have anyone to maintain it. On the other hand, um, if we use a generic RESTful API for this, for example, like operation one for file operations, operation two for permission checking, then uh, the front end needs to be modified too much uh, in order to compensate for the PHP migrations. So um, is there any way to can do to make it more similar to a serverless design? So this is why we actually use Auto. Auto is a JavaScript interpreter written in Go. Um, Basically, we expose a virtual machine interface for the front end to execute a section of JavaScript code or a specific file of JavaScript into the auto VM, and then the auto VM will interchange data with the RSOS core, allow it to provide and calculate the required result um, from the for the front end uh, applications. So, um, after some evaluation and development, we call it the RS Gateway Interface or AGI. There is a 100 page long technical white paper on our GitHub page. If you are interested, you can take a look at it. So um, in order to make our developer happier, so we develop a front end wrapper library for it. And it can be easily be used like this. So you just call the auto VM with a section of um, the path of the JavaScript file that you are referencing and with the variable right here. And then it will just execute your stuff and then return the result to you. Simple. And you may remember that we have a Go function adapters, right? And this is how we actually do the Go function adapters. So we actually allow the VM to escape and interrupt from a section of code when it's called to a virtual native JavaScript interface or functions. And um, in the Go code, it would do its Go Golang things and then return the result back into the functions. Okay. And this is how we have a whole set of web apps migrated from PHP to Golang. Now, the buyers can call the Go functions, of course, install, remove, reload, or during the RSOS is running. 
So subsurface. I think this is a little bit more interesting part. Um, because subservice allows not only Go developers, but even like Node.js developer, Python developer to develop RSOS with this interface. So uh, first of all, I'll talk about how, plug how plugin plugin for Golang. So um, currently, there's no cross-platform and cross-architecture Golang -ish way to actually do a plugin in Golang. So there's a few open source projects or native packages that do it. But it either requires CTO or linker files that only limited are uh, executable on to run on certain platforms, or it requires gRPCs, where it will add too much complexity on our web app development. So we can take a look on how people other people do it. Most people use Docker and then expose a new port to a reverse proxy and open the path in an iframe or new windows. Or some projects like Sandstorm, I remember, do modify their original open source app to fit their system. So is there any better solution to that? Um, so we just use reverse proxy. Um, so reverse proxy is basically just an application that allow external outcome incoming requests to be routed to a local server in your local area networks. And but we don't actually use it this way. We use it to route local hosts with different port uh, web applications to the same port where the RSOS is using. So um, for example, you can route an Apache with a PHP script into our front end as some kind of web applications. You can also reverse proxy some kind of binary table with web UI, for example, like SyncThings, uh, a famous synchronized file synchronized software, open source also. And uh, with GoTTY support, which is another Go open source project, you can also reverse proxy a terminal application on the web UI, something similar to a PuTTY or SSH connection will show up on the RSOS system. So um, my co-author actually used this method to host his Minecraft server on the RSOS system. So you can do it if you are interested. And the overall architecture of the RSOS on a subservice system will look like this. So um, I'm not going to go into detail from here, but if you're interested, our white paper is on our GitHub repo. So we can take a look on it. So implementing the reverse proxy. Um, the reverse proxy actually is not difficult to uh, implement. We have two originally built package for this. One is the WebSocket proxy. Another one is the reverse proxy from two open source developers. However, we need specific modification in that package to make it happen for two-way communication between our core program and a subservice. So how we actually do it? Well, um, first of all, we start the subservice using the x command, which is nothing special around here. And then we execute in a Go routine and we create a service proxy object that handles the reverse proxy. And lastly, we append it to the module list so that the users on the front end can actually see these modules. So um, the question is, when we implement it in this way, there is no way for the subservice module to know what users are actually accessing these resources and how we actually interact with the Go core program. For, for example, like um, checking if he has certain permission or checking if the file actually exists or not. So we specifically added a RESTful API into it so that um, every time a reverse proxy module is reverse proxying a request to your modules, your module can use that token session of JavaScript code or for our wrappers to access resources in the RSOS core. In this way, we establish two-way communication between the RSOS, which is the host operating system, and your modules, where it serves as a web app in our system. So um, if you don't like wrappers, of course, you can directly inject JavaScript in your Go program, but please don't do it, because it's messy. You can't actually maintain this, and it's really ugly. Okay. And uh, side note, we actually need a way for the um, RSOS to know how to launch your app. For example, if your app can be rescaled, um, it is suitable for uh, PWA mode or running on phone or mobile devices. So we need something metadata to need to pass metadata from your apps to the RSOS core. And there are two ways to do it. One is use the wrapper, and another one is use a file-based flag, which is some uh, which is a hack hacky method to make it works. So the correct way, the, the official way to use it is passing the struct that allow the RSOS system to know how to actually launch your module, for example, which is a DOCX viewer from one of our co-offers. And you can also do it with a JSON file with your, for example, a Python server or your Node.js project that next to your uh, start script 
where it can load and know how to actually launch your module in our system. So to summarize, there are three main types of apps in our server system. One is web apps, one is subservice, one is core module. From the front-end developer perspective of view, it looks basically identical. The API is the same. The, um, the core procedure for the back-end data is, is identical. And from the back-end, it is slightly different and designed for three different purposes. So, all right, we still got some time left, so we talk about OTA updates. Um, anyone know any official way to do OTA updates in Go? All right, no. Okay, this is also what I found on the internet. Basically, there's not much an OTA update method for Go programs. So, before RS 1.120, I remember, many users email us to ask how to update their RS OS system. And at that time, we don't actually have an official way to update. So we tell them, first of all, you go into SSH, and then you log into your server, and then run that update.sh script. Do you see that script? It's right there. And then you tell him many, many times, many, many users ask this question. So we just write, we just write a launcher, OK? So this is why we developed our RSOS launcher. Um, basically, what it does is that instead of letting the system D to start the RSOS system, we let our launcher to do the job and the launcher is start by system D instead. So um, the process basically runs like this. So the RS OS system, when an update request is done, it will start downloading the files in an update folder where it will terminate itself with a specific um, os.exit0 to allow the launcher to know that it exits correctly. And then the launcher will first of all back up the current system and then override the current uh, system with the update folder's content. And the launcher also build integrity check and result on panic and automate rollback. So basically, these features you will usually find on a modern launcher. And we also designed this to be um, updatable via a simple JSON script. So if you are an OEM manufacturer or you're using this project in your company, you can easily change the vendor of the update source. So basically, if you have uh, your own version of RSOS, you can change the link in a file so that your system, your company or system servers can be updated from your own repository instead. And if you are a Go developer as well, and you are looking for an OTA solution, we got a free one over here. And if you're interested, you can get it, uh, try it on your project. Basically, it do the same thing uh, with the RSOS launcher, but it has additional uh, configuration to allow you to configure to update your own binary instead. All right, future plans. So what are we going to do with the RSOS project in the future? So uh, you see that our current system is only limited to one machine, right? We don't actually uh, have the capability to run the system on multiple machines. And in the future, we are planning to work on a distributed file system in Go. So basically, what it means is that you will have multiple nodes of RSOS system on your local area network. And with the master node, you can access all your files in your storage pool within this system. And we are also working on open source NAS design um, powered by Armor uh, RISC-5 SBC. And on the right hand side, you can see this is our really early functional prototype of a NAS system that it didn't catch on fire, which is nice. Um, later on, we might add RISC-5 support, but we are still discussing this one. And we also want to add better Chinese localization. So basically, if you have um, interested in helping this project, you can come to me after this section and we can chat about how we can uh, work together and contribute to this project. So quick summary. So um, if you want to know more about the RSOS project, this is the link to it. Um, it works on basically anything. You can host it on ARM or x86 CPU um, devices like Raspberry Pi, um, Orange Pi, or whatever Pi, or old PC. Um, it works on Linux or Windows. So if you've got an old window PC lying around, you can use it. And you can also access it through your PC or touch devices. And it's simple to set up, and it is free to open source. So if you're interested, please go to this link above here. And if you are more on the technical person that wants to know about the details, how we actually design and implement this system, uh, we have an RSOS white paper or technical documentation on our GitHub repo. You can find it under the SRC folder. And um, it is really long. So if you're interested, you can take a look at it yourself. So contribution. So um, the main reason that I'm in this sharing session is that I'm looking for contributors for this project. So if you know anything about front-end developer or Go development, 
uh, feel free to join our Telegram group. Uh, but Telegram group is more for support, uh, technical support if you are using the system. And if you are developers, you can directly PR to our GitHub repo instead. So, um, okay. So this is basically the end of sharing. Um, I got a few souvenirs here. If you are interested, you can come to me and I will give you some little cute cards right here. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask me as well. Um, you can ask in Chinese or English, although my Chinese a little bit sucks. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So thanks for listening and have a nice day. Oh,有有,我们在那个,我们的GitHub Oh,都有啊,我们在上面有一个VS 其实很多用户也有问过这个问题对对对我们也在看这个部分但是这个现在还没有计划在做对 都没有直接可以传取到那个虚拟层的的terminal环境这样。对，最后面的这样子。那现在他在上面还有什么其他的限制？就一直延续啊，像比如说webcam啊，或者是啊，这个基本上我们都尽量去把资源加进去。我说
那如果大家没有问题的话，就是很高兴今天 Toby 带来一个这么有趣的最后的一个 talk。然后今天这是我们一场馆的最后一场，那也谢谢大家今天的参与。那我们明天见，谢谢大家。